Chapter Nine of Kilgloom Park by Neil Boyton S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Nine, Little Robber. What have you got there, Al? It was Angelo Daly who asked the question of the chief of the park guards. The big detective held up a sheet on which were the descriptions, fingerprints, and photographs of a man. Headquarters would like to have a few minutes private conversation with this chap. He is Red Regan, alias Dan Daly. A nice alias, put in G.T. Nice nothing, Angelo burst out. That crook has his nerve with him taking our family name. What's he wanted for, Al? Headquarters thinks he was the brain of the robbery of that silk loft in Manhattan last week. The one where they got the $30,000 worth of silks, and it wasn't discovered till 48 hours later? That's the crime, Sonny. What's the reward? Chubby Kramer questioned lazily from his wicker chair. No particular reward, but plenty of glory. Not interested. Well, I am, said Angelo earnestly. Say, Al, why did Detective Headquarters send you these pictures? On the chance that Red might come down here for a little recreation from his arduous occupation. Even a burglar needs relaxation, buddy. Well, this is no place for him to seek his amusements, G.T. declared. You're dead right, Georgie, earnestly Angelo agreed with his brother. Al, let me get a good look at those pictures. This profile one does look like Chubby, doesn't it, Al? Going into the private detective business, Angelo. Chubby gave the small boy a tolerant smile. You never can tell. Anyway, I'm wide awake, and I see lots of things. Wish you luck, Philo Holmes. Angelo daily paid no attention to the other's bantering remarks. He was holding the police sheet in both hands and studying the scowling features of one Red Regan, alias Dan Daly, badly wanted by the New York police. Finally, he returned the sheet to the park detective. I'll know him if our trails cross, boasted Angelo. Look out, Angelo. He may be armed and liable to give you a free ride to purgatory. It's a good thing I won't have to depend on your prayers to get me out, if he does, chubby. Oh, I'd gladly pray for you, if I knew that you were safely there. It would be such a relief to my mind. If that's all that is worrying your mind. Never mind both of your minds, worry. Come on, get to work, all of you, called Captain Daly, coming suddenly out of the executive office door. The boys scattered from their wicker chairs, but in Angelo Daly's mind was a mental picture of one Red Regan, alias Dan Daly. He put Buddy back in the jungle scene, and starting at the main entrance, began to scan the public for the sight of red hair. Flaming red hair, the bill had stated, five foot seven, weight about one sixty five, dresses neatly. There did not seem to be many red headed men among Kilgloom Park patrons that last Tuesday afternoon in July. Several torchy talk boys, GT's age, came in for a close scrutiny, but they evidently had been too young to have taken part in the recent loft robbery. At luncheon in the daily private apartments across Kilgloom Boulevard from the executive offices, G.T. began to joke his small brother on his lack of detective success. "'What's this?' Captain wanted to know. Angelo gave his father full details of Red Regan. "'Better leave the capture of one of burglars to Big Al and his men, son.' "'But, Cap, what should I do if I saw Red in the park?' "'Nothing, and be quick about it.' "'But, Cap, if I was sure.' "'In that case, walk quietly along a good distance behind your suspect.' till you came on one of the park guards. Go up to him quietly. Don't shout. Of course not. Go up to him quietly and tell him your suspicions, and then keep beyond gunshot. Why gunshot? Because one at men usually put up a fight. G.T. put in. Just suppose your red began to shoot it out with thousands of women and children in the park. When I heard the first shot, Cap, I would fall flat on the cement and lay there like a... like a boardwalk. Till the shooting was over. That's the sensible thing to do when you suddenly find yourself in no man's land. These days, in any big city, that might happen to you. Do as the soldiers are taught to do. Drop. Play private detective if you want to, Angelo. But remember, this amusement park is paying you good money to take care of certain of its monkeys. And no employee in this Kilgloom Park cap takes more care of them than I do. You ask Oscar and Pete or any of the animal men. They all say I was born to be an animal man, Cap. Very earnestly, Angelo Daly sung his own praises. 
Here, Mother Daly interrupted to warn Angelo to finish his lunch. Just a moment, Ma. I have an idea. Angelo dashed to his own room and returned to the table with a small gold star pinned over the left breast pocket of his khaki shirt. G-Man Daly, he announced, patting the star importantly. All right, G-Man, said the Daly mother. Eat more and you will do better work. Angelo spent the better part of the afternoon inspecting the hair of the park patrons. He thought it was singular the way redheads avoided this popular Coney Island amusement park that afternoon. About 7.30 in the evening, when the night crowd was streaming in under the electric light studded main entrance, Angelo's vigil was rewarded. A flaming-haired young man, five foot seven, weight about 165, stopped in front of the guest here weight scales. His young girl companion hesitated to have Mike Evans weigh her. If I don't guess the young lady's weight within three pounds, it won't cost you anything. The red-haired suspect finally said, I'll let him guess mine. He stepped forward, and Mike felt his arms and announced, I guess this young man weighs as, as 166. The man sat in the scales, and they registered 165 pounds. Angela wedged himself closer to his suspect. Yes, there was a strong resemblance to the man wanted on Big Al's sheet. Angelo cast a rapid glance around Coglin Boulevard, but the chief of the park guards was not in sight. The young girl companion finally was weighed, and Mike missed out. When the suspect had paid the scales man, he and his companion drifted over to the sky chaser. Angelo almost trod on their shadows. At the entrance to the half-mile scenic railway, the girl refused to attempt the ride. Angelo heard her say, No, those coasters take my breath away, Red. Angelo's features brightened at the nickname. He kept an anxious eye out for Big Al or any of the park boys whom he could send after him. Finally, he sighted Chubby Kramer, returning leisurely from a late supper hour. Angelo beckoned mysteriously. Chubby came up smiling. Don't say a word, warned Angelo, speaking out of the side of his mouth, but shoot about and find Big Al immediately. More of your private detective work, said Chubby with a maddening grin. I am late now, and I have to get back to the miniature railway. Angelo waved him away in disgust. The suspect and his girlfriend had drifted over to the airships in the center of the court of Kilgloom. The boy detective saw the man approach the ticket box and purchase two tickets. He and his companion ascended to the platform and waited while the swings that were suspended from a center pole had ceased flying round and round. As the amusement device came to a stop, Angela watched Red and his companion step into an airship. He circled about till he was able to read the name of the car. Chicago, he muttered to himself. Not a bad ship for that gun man to pick. All the passengers were now loaded into the various cars, and Angela breathed a sigh of relief as he saw the Chicago circle further and further out and assume an ever-steepening angle as it whirled round. The boy went to the engineer and whispered, Bill, there is somebody on one of those airships now, whom Big Al is anxious to look at. Could you? I see, said the employee at the control switch of the airships. You scout around the park and find Big Al. I'll keep this contraption going round till you come back. But don't be long. I won't. Angelo dodged in and out of the public till he was down by the pass gate. As he suspected, Big Al Dundee was lolling in the window, casually inspecting the lines of pleasure seekers, who were streaming in through the brass railed entrance lanes. Ow, the boy whispered excitedly. Bill the engineer promised to keep the airship swinging round till you got there if you hurry. Why the hurry? I don't want to ride. Because in one of the cars is that red Regan, whose picture you have in your pocket. You don't say. The chief of the park guards had come to life. Angelo dog trotted up Coglin Boulevard alongside the park guard, both took up an inconspicuous position from which they could inspect the passengers in the flying airships. Big Al shifted his position till he commanded a better view of the two in the Chicago car. When he had inspected the man for some seconds, he turned to the eager boy and said out of the side of his mouth, You're wrong, Angelo. That is not Red Regan. Angelo showed disappointment in his usually pleasant features. I have been trailing the wrong fellow all the last hour, have I, Al? Yes, but you've had better luck. With this cryptic remark, Big Al Dundee went to the engineer and told him to keep the amusement device whirling till he got back. Then he signaled a park guard to come over. Both whispered together, and the curious Angelo could not catch a word they said. 
the guard took up a position near the Chicago, and its two occupants were always in sight. Big Al hurried away in the direction of the executive offices. Andy, the other part guard, would tell Angelo nothing. But by his mysterious manner, the boy sensed that something important was in the air. Angelo decided then and there to cling to Andy's shadow. The flying airships kept circling round and round. It was minutes over the usual ride, and passengers were calling out to be let down, but they were helpless to stop the whirling device. In less than five minutes, Big Al was back and two plainclothes men from the 8th Street Station were with him. All inspected the young man in the flying car, Chicago. That's him, all right, Angelo heard one of the plainclothes men murmur. Angelo, Richard Big Al, go to Bill and tell him to stop the airships and have that Chicago car come to a standstill at the back of the platform. We're going to try and nab this young gentleman without attracting too much attention. You keep away, for he may object. You mean he might draw his automatic? Angelo's eyes danced. I don't think he will, but he is highly liable to attempt anything. Hurry now, and then get out of range. Angelo daily went over to the engineer of the flying airships, and in an excited whisper gave him Big Owl's orders. An arrest, hey? said Bill. Then you station yourself behind that engine, for I am going to do so as soon as the car has come to a stop. The boy went behind the protection of the engine but he exposed enough of his head to stop several bullets. Angelo saw the airships begin to swim into the circular platform as their speed was diminished. When the cars were flying ten feet away from the platform, Big Al and the two plainclothes men sauntered up and stationed themselves in the crowd of passengers, waiting impatiently their turn to ride. The Chicago swung round and disappeared. Then it was slowing at the back of the platform. Bill threw the switch and leaped nimbly to a protected position beside Angelo. I saw detectives nab a gunman once, and he drew his gun a split second faster than the bulls did. Then I thought I was back in France, and I dove for the nearest thing to a shell hole. You just drop if you hear a gun bark. Don't you worry. This G-man will be flat as a pole table before you begin to bend your knees, Bill, promised the boy, whose eyes were almost popping out of his head with excitement. The red-haired young man was helping his escort out of the car onto the platform when the three detectives closed in. Angela saw the blunt blue nose of an automatic flash out of Big Al's pocket, and the next second the two plainclothes men had the suspect handcuffed. The young woman screamed, but in that pleasure-seeking crowd, the cry passed for one of delight. The two prisoners were hustled down from the platform and walked toward the old swimming hole building. Angela followed on eager feet. He knew the detectives were taking the suspects quietly out of the amusement park by a side exit. The little group walked through the hundreds of pleasure seekers without attracting attention. Big Al was talking to the girl. He had her arm in his, and Angelo knew he had an arrest grip on it. The group passed into the old swimming hole entrance. So did Angelo. He trailed them down the long corridor till they came to the emergency exit. Here Big Al unlocked the door, and the plainclothes men and their two prisoners were hustled into a waiting police car. When Big Al was relocking the door, Angelo made himself audible. Well, you took him up, I see. Wasn't he Red Regan? Yes, bud. No, bud. Regan is still at large, but your sharp eyes picked out a bigger prize. How was that? Angelo wanted to know. That young gentleman, whom I just let out of one of the park's private exits, is Red Raskoff. Never heard of him. Angela confessed his disappointment. Well, your Uncle Sam did, and he is so anxious to have a talk with him that he has a standing offer of $1,000 for his arrest. $1,000? What did he do? He was mixed up in a mail car robbery out in Canton, Ohio, last month, and he is the one who shot the mail clerk. A murderer? Angela was having enough excitement to satisfy even him. I oom. Then he might easily have shot it out. Yes, that type will usually shoot it out. That's why we got the drop on him. If he made a move toward his pocket, he was a dead gunman. He knew it, and he submitted to arrest like a lamb. But let us talk about pleasanter things. You are entitled to a share in that reward. I oom. G Man Daly was dancing. Just wait till I tell the fellows that. And Chubby, who wouldn't help collect that reward. Just wait till I broadcast that. I oom. Angela Daly flew down the long corridor of the bathhouse to spread the good news in tearing tiger circles. 
End of Chapter 9 Recording by Maria Therese